All right, we're now going to look at the motion of charged particles in electrical field and the magnetic field as an application. So one of them is a cyclotron, which is part of an accelerator. So it's a combination of the two fields that actually help the uh, charged ions in here reach very high speeds for nuclear reactions in research or in making medical radioisotopes. So the one we've got here is an example. This is from the CERN one. Uh, let's have a look at this. So why would you need charged ions to have high speeds to cause a nuclear reaction. Well, you've got to remember that the nucleus is made up of protons and neutrons. So it has got a large number of protons in there. And obviously, as this approaches then, it's going to have a large electrostatic repulsion. And it normally doesn't get close enough for a nuclear reaction to occur because nuclear forces only occur over a short range. So that's why you need to get it through very high energy through a particle accelerator. So the one we're focusing on in the course is the cyclotron. So if you look at the cyclotron here, it's actually made up of two Ds there, which are copper electrodes. Okay? They're hollowed out. If you look at them in cross-section, they're like this. So the D here is like that. There's your D. Okay? And there's a D on the other side as well, which is backwards. All right. So there's your D there. And running through the D, you see we've got a magnetic field, which is into the board in this case. So that's indicated here by these crosses here. So the magnetic field is into the board, uniform throughout. Now inside these copper Ds, they're metal electrodes and they're hollow, so there'll be no electrical field. But if you make one of these a positive charge here, and one a negative, between the Ds here you'll find a region of the electrical field here which is uniform. And that's when used to cause the ions to gain kinetic energy. So that's going to gain kinetic energy there, due to the electric field. That's the main purpose. It actually accelerates them. So if you look at the formula there, you can use A equals EQ over M as one of the formulas to work out the acceleration. You can look at the change in the speed there using the equations of motion. Okay? So that's one thing you could do. It's not typical to do it that way. It's more typical to look at the gain in kinetic energy due to the work done by electrical field, in which case you're looking at work equals delta VQ. So you could look at this as maybe having a thousand volts there. So we would expect after one cross here of the field, a positive ion would gain, say like a hydrogen ion, would gain 1,000 electron volts of kinetic energy there. Okay? You could get that in joules by times it by 1.6 by 10 to the minus 19. But that's after just one cross, okay? So 1.6 by 10 to the minus 16 joules. So that would be the energy from one cross. Now to get this to the sort of speeds we need for nuclear reactions, we need to get this across lots of times. So apart from this electrical field which is across here, which is used to cause it to gain kinetic energy, we've also got a magnetic field into the page here. And what that does as a roll is it causes this to follow a semicircular path when it gets to here. And the reason it does that is that the velocity will always have a force at 90 degrees to it, providing centripetal acceleration. You've even got a formula for the size of that force, QVB sine theta, where sine of theta in this case would be 1. Okay? And you can use your right hand rule here where the thumb is put in the direction of the velocity and that shows you that the field is into the page and the force will be up. Okay? So you're going to get a uniform acceleration or a uniform force on the charged particle which causes it to follow a semicircle. So that will turn it around. It won't gain any kinetic energy here because there's no electrical field inside the Ds because it's a hollow conductor. Just remember that. So that's the job here is to turn it around. Turn the iron around usually positive ions, around, so that it crosses the field many times and achieves the really high kinetic energy you need. Now, as it gets to this point here, what's going to happen is it's going to cross again. To get it to speed up again, or gain kinetic energy again, we need to swap these terminals around so this one becomes positive now. now. So this one becomes positive, and that one now becomes negative. So that's why this is an alternating current. And it's got to be set, just as it gets to here, we're going to reverse this. And therefore the electrical field will cause this to jump across again and gain kinetic energy again. So it should come across here faster. Okay? Enter this next D at a higher speed. Now if you remember your work from earlier, R is equal to MV over QB, for a charged particle in the magnetic field. And if this is now going faster here, at a higher speed, we expect the radius of this circle to be higher or bigger. So we're going to get it coming in and be larger like that. So if you look at this as an overall thing, you're going to find it's going to spiral outwards, 
gaining kinetic energy on each electric field cross with a magnetic field causing it to be turned to allow multiple crosses. So the purpose of the electric field is to gain kinetic energy due to the work done by the field. The magnetic field's role is to provide a forceless internal acceleration which will therefore accelerate it and turn it around along a semicircle and cross again and again. And that formula is still valid. So it just goes to larger radii on each cross. Okay? And in cross section, you've got a magnetic field here. So the magnetic field here is often created by an uh, electromagnet. So you might have a north pole and a south pole. This one here is probably upside down compared to my diagram because this would be going up out of the page. So the north pole and my diagram is on top. Now, you can send the ions in either by ionising them in the, in the first place, the more modern ones do that. The older ones tend to have a filament in here and they actually inject some gas in, like hydrogen gas. So the filament will carry a negative charge and between that and the positive D nearby, you get electrons leading that and being accelerated through the gas, causing collisions with the gas here, the electrons coming through, and that will knock electrons off and ionise them so they become positive charged ions. Okay. So like just a proton from a hydrogen ion. So that's how it initially happened. Once you've got some protons in there in this region, they would start to accelerate and they'd follow that pattern on the way out. So let's just look at some of those in action. I've got one here from Berkeley. So we got two of these and we have now working in the front of So what you can see here is an ion appears after it's been sort of ionised. That gets accelerated by electrical field normally, but in this case, this particular plate is higher than the other plate, and so it goes and falls down and gains energy because the gravitational field is like going down a slope. Okay? When it gets to the other side here, this actually comes up, and again it drops energy across when it crosses the D the other way, and it keeps doing that. What you can see happening is more and more come out and they remain in sync with each other but they get a wider and wider circles as they spiral outwards. So that's a model that Berkeley did in uh, 2009. So one of the types of questions they could say is what's the kinetic energy when it leaves the cyclotron? There's a couple of ways of finding that. If you know the number of crosses, that's one approach. Because if we said this is a thousand volts between the two Ds there, that means that at every cross we're going to gain an equivalent energy to the work done by the field, delta VQ, and in electron volts it's just going to be a thousand electron volts, which you could convert to joules. That would allow you to work out the kinetic energy in one cross. If you did, say, 150 crosses then, then you would go, oh, it's 150 times by that electron volt energy and you've got 150,000 electron volts as it leaves the cyclotron based on the energy gain per cross and the number of crosses. So that's one way of doing it. You could get it with another formula though. The kinetic energy of anything is half mv squared. Okay? You do have another formula for velocity here, and it comes from r equals mv over qb on the formula sheet. So if you rearrange this for v, the qb is going to come up the top next to the r, so RQB, and the M's going to go down away from the velocity, you've got this here. So that's a formula for velocity of anything as a charged particle going in a circular motion in a magnetic field. All right? So you've got a half M, so V is going to be squared RQB over M, all squared. You've got a half M, now this is R squared Q squared B squared over M squared. So what you're going to have here is that the ends are going to cancel and you'll end up with an alternative formula here of k is r squared q squared b squared over 2 at the bottom with the n. And that's on the formula sheet for a cyclotron. So if you know the charge of the ion that's going through and its mass and the radius of the cyclotron and its field strength, that's what determines the final kinetic energy. In actual fact, for any fixed ions, it really is based on the radius of the cyclotron and its field strength, magnetic field strength. How strong is magnetic field? And it doesn't depend on this case on the potential difference then. So why is that? Why is it really the, uh, the final kinetic energy here only really depends on what's the magnetic field strength I'm using in the board and how big is the actual cyclotron in radius? 
So if you were to try a thousand volts here, you may get a certain radius path here and certain size spiral as it goes out and heads towards the exit. If you go and change to 2000 volts, how would that differ then? At each cross, what's going to happen is different then. At each cross, we're going to gain more kinetic energy when it gets to there. Twice as much. So we'll actually be going faster when it comes out here. Now don't forget, if it's going faster, we expect it to go to a bigger radius circle. So instead of being quite a tight circle here, like that, and doing lots of crosses and coming out, terrible diagram, sorry, you're going to get a different result. The blue one, we're going to gain more energy on each cross. The circles are going to be bigger. So these are going to be bigger circles because on each cross it gains more energy, but it's going to do less crosses. So more energy per cross, right? More kinetic energy gained per cross, but you do less crosses. And overall, it comes out with the same kinetic energy. The two kinetic energies actually match. One will do more crosses, but gain less kinetic energy per cross. So that's why the kinetic energy is not dependent on this voltage as a total. So that means you've got two ways of finding the kinetic energy here. You've got delta VQ, and if you knew the number of crosses there, that would allow you to find it. Or you've got this formula based on the properties of the actual ion and the cyclotron itself. Okay. Having found the kinetic energy, don't forget you can always work out the velocity as it leaves by rearranging this formula here. So we also need to look at the period here because it's pretty critical when you reverse the Ds. That alternating current there needs to be set at a frequency so that just as the ion reaches this side here, it reverses. And when it comes through and gets to here, it reverses. When it gets to here, it reverses. So it's important that it reverses as it's about to enter the electric field each time. So you've got to set that frequency correctly. So how do you do that? But we've got to look at period first of all. So we need to be able to derive a formula first of all for the period, the time it takes to go around one circle. So if we just look at this half circle, you've got a formula for velocity, because velocity is the displacement over the time, or this is travel over the time. In this case, it's not 2 pi r here and here. It's only pi r, because then you're a half a circle. And that takes a certain time to do that. Okay? Have we got any other form of velocity going around in a circular magnetic field? We've got this one here, r equals mv over qb. So if we rearrange this formula here, we can use v equals r qb over m for any charged particle moving in a magnetic field. So the velocity here would be r qb over m. So based on that then, we've got two velocity formulas. If you equate the two together, r qb over m equals pi r over t, and that will tell you the time for a half circle. So as you rearrange this around, we can actually cross out the r's first of all, and get the t, the subject of the formula at the top here, and you leave your pi there, and bring the m up, and take the qb down. And that's the formula for the time taken for a half circle. You've got to remember that as a full circle, because when you get to the other side here, it's now going to go like that. To do each full circle then, one full circle, the period would be two lots of that. 2 pi m over qb. And that's on the formula sheet as a derivation. So you need to be conscious of the able to combine those two ideas to derive that formula. Because it is a derivation in the course. Now that actually allows us to work out the frequency then. Because if you know the period, t equals 2 pi m over qb, to get the actual frequency from last year's work, it's 1 over t. If you've got something that's 50 hertz, it means the period is 1 50th of a second, and vice versa. If something that takes two seconds, the frequency is a half a hertz. So they're per perfect reciprocals. So in this case, we can actually flip this upside down then. That's QB over 2 pi m. And we would know what frequency in hertz to set our cyclotron on, so that it actually reverse the Ds at just the right time. So you've got quite a few formulas here if you look at this. You can work out the kinetic energy as it leaves by using n delta vq, where n is the number of crosses. You've got the formula q squared b squared r squared, or any version of that, over 2 to n. 
you can work out the that one is perfectly valid anywhere in any magnetic field by the way and you've got one for the period 2 pi m over qb and at any stage you can work out the velocity then by rearranging a half mv squared to find the speed as it comes out all right so there's some key things to be aware of